My name is Norbert Elliott. I'm professor of English at New Jersey Institute of Technology. My research areas are in history, theory, and especially in empirical work in the assessment of writing ability. If we would begin by a definition of the field, uh, maybe we could, could get some help from our friends in, in educational measurement. They often talk about a universe of a construct. A construct is a particular mental model, something that we want to try to, to get a hold of, to study. And composition and rhetoric are part of a much larger domain of the universe of, of discourse. Um, and we, we can think about that in a wide range of ways. We can think about that from writing in non-academic settings, professional and technical writing, we can think about the new world of multimedia discourse that we have, where, where, where digital media is allowing us to rethink, as, as the researcher J, Stephen J. Bolter tells us, uh, allows us to see a broader venue of discourse. So I, I think that if we concentrate on composition and rhetoric, we should concentrate it on being a much larger part of a world or a universe of, of discourse. And we have, our, we have young people with us in the university most often for those first two years, and it's a very important time, it's a time in which we, we set a disposition for inquiry for them. And that's something that's going to last them for the rest of their lifetime. So I, I think the composition and rhetoric is, is certainly a, a way of getting students up to a certain kind of literacy, but it's more than that. It's a way of introducing them to a kind of heuristic value about life. And if we, if we do our jobs well, then they begin to explore other areas of the construct as well. They, they go from freshman composition to professional writing to digital media and back again in a, a much larger universe of, of discourse. So I, th I think in, in that way, if we think about the English arts, composition and rhetoric is a very focused kind of way. It, it, it helps students to learn a certain way of expression, a certain way of research, a certain way of conducting their ideas that is nuanced and careful and very, very attentive to language. Now, I, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about composition and rhetoric as if it's exclusive. Um, I, I think that the world of technical professional writing is very important to students at New Jersey Institute of Technology where I, where I teach. Students will graduate from there and write proposals. They'll do budget narratives. So what we, what we have to do is, is set a, a, a mood for them in the first two years that will allow them to float equally into these other fields and not see enormous sharp distinctions between academic and non-academic discourse. I think that's a very important part of what, what we should be doing in, in the first two years. As far as my own research, so much of it has been classroom-based. So much of what I do asks a kind of simple question. What are the abilities of students to handle composition and rhetoric within the first two years? Um, and so I do measurement work. Um, as well, though, I work in professional and technical writing settings. So I also work in the junior level with students in a technical writing course, and my primary teaching assignment is to a master's program in professional and technical communication. So I, I like to imagine that I, I have that whole universe of discourse to, to work in, and I, I think that, that my research sort of spans that world. I, I don't feel that I have to work in one area, another area, and I think that quite a few people in our field, Les Perlman of MIT, Chris Anson. I think a, a lot of people range back and forth uh, among and between these, these kinds of worlds. Um, my own research was heavily influenced when I first started by Edward White. Uh, Ed, Ed White is probably the, um, the leading figure of the generation came just before mine in writing assessment. And I think Ed's generosity towards young folks and his, 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 his way of practically understanding that which must be done when accountability demands faces. Um, the ways that people in composition and rhetoric, technical and professional writing can account to a wide variety of shareholders, students, parents, board members at universities, future employers, asking a question, do students have sufficient literacy skills to be able to succeed in the setting that they're going to be able to go into? And I think Ed's been very important there. But a lot of my work, as I said, is, is historical. Um, my last book was um, on a scale, a social history of writing assessment in America, and I'm finishing a biography now of Henry Chauncey. So 
that part of my career, I think, was heavily influenced by the late James Berlin. I think that Berlin, in his early studies of rhetoric and composition in colleges, was very important to a lot of us because it, it let us realize we had a home. It let us realize we had a history. And bringing forward that history to new generations of readers and scholars has been an important part of, of what it is that, that I do. As, as the other thing, though, is, is I, I have to say that I think that composition studies needs a lot more empirical work. I, I think that quite often our programs, whether they're in the masters or the doctoral level, don't have enough courses in the kind of ways of thinking that statistical analysis yields, for example. And I think that a lot of us went into the humanities to get away from that stuff. And if we can sort of put that on a side for a while and, and say to ourselves, is there a way of thinking that statistics offers us, that educational measurement offers us, that can allow us to be better teachers? And if we sort of drop the frame of reference that math was for someone else, and we realize that, candidly, as far as technology goes, the software plugs it away now, then I think we have a much better way of, of thinking about what it is that we do and the impacts that we have. So I guess the, the third influence was the educational testing service, uh, as was the case with, with Ed White. Folks at ETS have been very good to me through the years. Um, and they've been very careful to welcome the kind of work that I do into uh, an environment that is, is a testing environment that is very often criticized by people in our field. That's not been my experience, and I don't think it's been my colleague Ed White's experience either. I think that places like ETS, these large nonprofit testing places, want to make better tests. And so if we, if we just stand over against them and criticize, then we're not really doing our job. But working with them, collaborating becomes important. So really then I'll, I'll cite those influences, then a person, Ed White, uh, another person, James Berlin, and an organization, the, the Educational Testing Service. But let me go back to the idea of technology again, because that is a very important part in anybody who's going to take a PhD in rhetoric and composition and then go out and have a substantial impact. You know, it, the from, from simple things like blogs for students, uh, a, a diary that's no longer a private transaction between teacher and student, but at the end of a URL is a post that a student makes on something that she's reading, complete with images, complete with links to music. What a more rich and enlivened world that allows a student to have. So something from as simple as introducing a blog into a class to as complex as setting up an e-portfolio system so that, so that every student who's, who's, who's in perhaps should become a writing, writing program administrator. And so imagine hundreds and not thousands of students all using a software that would allow everything that they've done throughout the semester to be, be put up, drafts, final copies, essays, poems, short stories, a wide variety of things that then the, the, the newly minted PhD and her writing program colleagues can then go in and examine in some kind of systematic way to allow some evidence to come forward that something important is really going on in, the, in this curriculum. And that evidence goes back, first of all, most important to the students, that the students realize that they are the important object of study. It goes forward to the department, the department chair, the dean, the board of trustees, employers. And I think technology allows that to happen. I think it, when I was coming through the system and we had single time writing samples and so much hung on those, you always had the feeling you were not really allowing the students to strut their best stuff. But now it's, it's not true. The digital world allows this to happen. And of course the open source movement is absolutely wonderful because there was a time when you could even get in the door unless you were willing to buy a commercial and licensed product. But now so much of what's produced is, is free and open source or, or a company's a textbook that, 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 that the new writing program administrator will, will try to find not only a textbook anymore but a rich digital environment that will allow students to hone their skills and to put up their work. So technology has become an, an incredibly important thing, incredibly important part of our, of, our, of our field. And I think that's part of what still excites me about this, that it, it, it's, it's not a field that's static. It's not a field that has an end. It's a field that's, uh, that's capacious. It's a field that expands as, as the culture expands and as, as society 
expands. Um, at 57, I still look forward to teaching my master's program because my program is totally online. I have students in Israel who I've, I've graduated with very good master's degrees who I've really never laid eyes on, but I've had communications with them five, six, seven times a week, sometimes three or four times a day. And the digital world has allowed me to have experiences with students who under normal conditions I would never meet and in cultures I would otherwise never have contact with. So part of what excites me is this very idea of technology and what it might be able to, to yield. But the question of research impacting teaching is always a really good one because I, I think that we, we know it works, but we really don't know how it works. We read the journals that our, our colleagues, our, our, our dissertation directors are publishing when we first graduate, and then we begin to write for those journals ourselves. And I think what probably happens is something like this. We, we read the work of others, and we begin to have some interesting ideas of our own. Then we go out and we try out those ideas. We either try them out of our students, we try them out in the library, we try them out in, in, in bibliographic research or in field research. And then we begin to, to sort of mediate those ideas with our own ideas. And eventually, after doing that, a kind of switch flips in our mind and we begin to have those ideas, not only as someone else's, but our own ideas. And that's when the magic starts to happen for a newly minted PhD, because that's when, when someone winds up at four C's or ATTW or CPTSC, making the first set of presentations. And then someone comes up to you after and someone says, you know, it's a really good idea. We're putting a journal issue together on this. Maybe you'd like to think about putting a proposal where the call for proposals will come on. And after the conference, you go home and you say, well, let's, let's give this a try. Let's give it a go. And I, I think that that's how careers get launched. I, I, I don't think the process is, is quite as formal as we'd like to believe it is. I think it's a socialization into the profession. And I think that, that uh, composition and rhetoric is a field that, that, that I, I, I think always um, welcomes people into it. You know, I, I often think about my experiences in this field and my experiences in graduate school. I, I took my PhD from the University of Tennessee in, in literature. Some people there were just enormously welcoming. Uh, Thomas Heffernan, uh, uh, who's a, a, a great, a great medievalist, uh, was a really dear friend. Um, but you know, other people just simply dismissed you. You know, you, you just simply weren't bright enough. I remember having a particularly bad patch with my preliminary examinations, and and uh, I, I had failed the 18th century prelim, and I was just brought in and told, "Well, this it was over." was over for me, uh, that, that uh, you know, we had to pass four prelims, I had had problems with one of them, and that I had spent enormous time studying that field, and the fellow sat behind the desk and said, well, you just simply don't have a feel for it, you know, this just simply isn't anything you're going to be able to do. You know, I, my God, I had a young child, I was uh, my late 20s, and other people pulled me out of that morass and said, no, no, it's, it's not quite true, there may be some other things that, uh, that we can think about that you might be able to do. But I must say, I did not find the kind of warmth or community in that particular field. Uh, that, all that having been said, uh, I love literature, and I, my, my passion to literature exceeded the people who were handling it at the particular time when I was taking my doctorate. So I teach a two-semester world literature course. Uh, I don't teach it as often as I like, but I'm very proud of it. And I, I like to think that the lines between composition and rhetoric don't need to be as sharp as they have been. I, I'd like to see more interchange back and forth. I, I think that people like, people like Peter Elbow want that to happen, and there's a tradition of our field of, of people doing that. But I, I wonder sometimes if, if in my generation those, those, those things will be brought together, because quite frequently when they are, uh, people turn attention to the literature and forget about the students who are interacting with it so that literature becomes the gold for its own sake as opposed to a way to help students experience their ideas more deeply and write about them. And I, I often fear that when I see a literature movement coming into a composition classroom that the students are the ones who will be caught in the crossfire. Uh, and I think those things still exist. I, I teach at a place like New Jersey Institute of Technology, no doubt about it, 
because I think that those environments are much more welcoming to people like me who really enjoy going out and working in corporations or in organizational settings. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think any of us want to have that taken away from us, that somehow that disqualifies us from being in English departments or in writing departments. It's just more of that universe of discourse. What advice for young people? Um, boy, stick with it. Um, it. Research takes a long, long time. And I think that as soon as you do your dissertation or while you're doing it, you need to develop a, an enormous sense of tenacity. Uh, it, it, it's, there's an incubation process with ideas that we talk about with our students and don't apply to ourselves, but it nevertheless is very true. It takes a long, long time to try to figure out how to do research and what questions to ask. And that doesn't mean you can't publish. It doesn't mean you can't write while you're doing that. You publish and write and get better as you publish and write. So the second piece of advice is write and write more and write more and publish and put things in the mail and just take your rejection letters, take the things that are best in them, make the article better and send it out to another journal. Simply the idea of publishing becomes very important to young people because it allows them a foothold in a field in what I think is a very worthy um, part of the academy, and that is the study of composition and rhetoric. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks.